<laughs> I've often heard the expression that you don't want to be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. And that was always used in the context of trying to say that you want to be practical or pragmatic, living in the world and not of the world, but dealing with it in such a way that you still have the abundant life, but don't let that spiritual life invade your practical life. That there's these concentric circles that you keep distant and they only overlap in certain ways in certain areas and that you can compartmentalize yourself into networking your faith with your relationship in the world your job life would be a pragmatic way of demonstrating to the world that your faith is real because you're a morally good person or that you're a upright standing in the community would be the demonstration that your faith has made a complete work of God in you so that you could be the example of faith in a way that is practical and real because you have this abundance in your life that you have the world's goods that you have succeeded where others have failed a prime example of that would be the Glenn Beck story, which is one of a man who, by his own admission, was a raging alcoholic. And he said that he went into the program of trying to give up alcohol and save his career and his life. And as he did, he seems to have gotten religious, you know, and as he got religious, he seems to have chosen the Mormon religion for his way of discovering his higher power. And as you listen to his philosophy on life and his teaching, although many Christians are involved in it, he seems to be manipulating all of it to work out prosperity and conformity to his image of what he thinks the world should be and the way he wants it to occur for himself, his country, and his way of thinking. I wonder where in all this pragmatic idealism, the idea of what Jesus said comes to reality. Is there a denial of self in all of this? Is there a poverty of spirit? Is there a realization that success is not the ultimate goal, but the relationship with Jesus is? That God, should he cause you to prosper, Proverbs teaches you don't set your mind upon those things. That should he put you in paneled houses, don't forget the Lord your God. That should he bring those abundances of things that may be practical in the world, that we are not to set our affection on those things, but we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And though all these things be added unto us, we are supposed to recognize that this is not our home where we are passing through and that the abundance comes into us in order to go out to others not for our own gain so I wonder in seeking to build up the church has the church lost its capability to make disciples of all nations has it lost its strength in causing individuals to know the truth in such a degree that without their church and without their pastor, they would still be men and women of God, dynamic in the Lord. And that should the stuffing or the soapbox get knocked out from under them, would they still have the faith of God that doesn't need the thousands and the applause and the accolades of all those around them in order to have faith and to demonstrate it? Or will they go when the world falls apart, away from walking with Jesus day to day. I don't know. I know what the Word says, and I know what Jesus did. I know that he didn't set his affections on the things that men said to him, and he did not care that those who came to him came for miracles, but he confronted them at a certain point in time when they were ready to hear the Word of God as he wanted to teach them. And he said, you come to me for miracles. And you come to me because you've heard of all these marvelous things. But 
will you stay with me when I confront you in the ways that you will not bear to hear, when I tell you the truth, when I cause you to hear things you're not ready to hear? Will you follow me then, or will you walk away in the end? And the truth is, when Jesus tells you something you don't want to hear, you ignore it. You do, until you come to the place where you're willing to participate with God in it. And you will come to that place, irregardless of what you think or feel. God will bring you over and over again, till finally the time comes when you're willing to accept what God has to say to you personally. And then you recognize how easy it is once you obey, rather than compromise the things God says. It's a dangerous philosophy about success is everything. For it's not in the successes we find ourselves, but in the failures we realize that God succeeds. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Romans 1.18 The philosophy of pragmatism, basically, the doctrine of the utility of truth, is having a powerful influence upon Christianity in the latter half of the 20th century. For the pragmatist, there are no absolutes. Nothing is absolutely God and nothing is absolutely true. Truth and morality float on a sea of human experience. For the pragmatist, truth is of no use. Whatever is useful is true for the user at the time that is needed, and though for someone else it may not be useful, so it is not true for them. The truth of any idea is its ability to be useful is what it's produced upon, and to produce desirable results. Thus it is pragmatic in its scientific application of faith as opposed to trusting in the results to God and let him find his desired will for what is to be accomplished, not the instantaneous gratification of the person of what they want to be done in what they are saying will be done. This pragmatism is stripped of its jargon if it shows that the results of it is false because the truth of its ability is to produce only those desirable results of the person who desires it. We live in a day when no one wants to argue with success. We flaunt the idea that that man is great, so it must have been Jesus who gave him that greatness. Oh, we love the idea of, oh, I owe it all to God. I give Jesus the glory for my touchdown. I am, after all, a man that was made this way by what Jesus has done. It is useless to plead for the human soul it is useless to insist that a man can do is less important than what he is. For it is not so important that what he is, but what he accomplished on the football field, in the baseball arena, in what he has done with his life, not what he has done to his wife. For we don't look at what the man is, but we put accolades on what the man accomplished. It's not so bad that he killed dogs for a living. Oh but he was such a great quarterback. It's not so bad that he was a child pedophile that went out and molested children, but he was such a great coach and he set up such marvelous organizations to help those out and help himself with some of them. So the pragmatic morality is always accomplished by what we measure success as. And we are so shocked when that person who is successful fails our expectation because we placed the pragmatic faith above the reality of relationship. The spectacular drama of successful deeds leaves the beholder breathless. Deeds you can obviously see. Oh, they were such a success. So who cares about ideals and character and morals? These things are for poets and nice old ladies and philosophers. And of course, if they get caught. So let's get on with the job. The weakness of all this in the church is its tragic short-sightedness. Because it sees an instant result, so it accepts it as being acceptable. We brought all these people in, we had such dynamic concerts. Never mind that the musician was ungodly or that the musician fell from grace. Never mind that the musician had as much a need as 
the people that he was seeking to bring to the Lord, never mind that that person didn't even believe in God. So does the end in pragmatism justify the means? Or is the end not what the means were all about, but rather neither one has accomplished the purpose that God designed? It never takes a long view of religious activity, but goes cheerfully on believing that because it works, it is both good and true. Well, the numbers are there. Look at all the people that are coming. Look at all the people in our crusades. Look at all the people that are saved. And look at how many times they offer themselves up for salvation over and over and over again. It is satisfied with present success and shakes off any suggestion that its works may go up in smoke in the day of Christ. It's far easier to say, it looks good, it seems good, so it must be good, than to take the reality of what Jesus did and reduce the thousands that came to him to be fed and to see the miracles and to reduce them down to 12. For when you see a megachurch decline to a solid body of dynamic men of God, then you'll know that God is in that place and he is in charge. But as long as you simply see the numbers increase, then I think you see more of the world and its perspective of what success is then you see how God measures success. For there is no rapture that comes that takes everybody who just thinks they're going to be taken away and rescued in that day. For the wheat will be judged. And the sheck of tossing the wheat up, of it flying away in the wind, will be decided in that day. For two shall be taken, and one shall be left behind. For there shall be Two walking in the field, one shall be taken, and one left behind. Two shall be asleep in the bed, one shall be taken, and one left behind. And we know that in the twinkling of an eye, they would be changed. We know that these same ones are like a parable unto the ten virgins, who five were wise, and they all ten were looking for the Lord's return, and five had extra oil, for they had prepared themselves, and they were watching and seeking and aware that Jesus is coming. And when the cry came out, oh, behold, the bridegroom cometh. They all went out to see him. But unfortunately, the Lord delayed his coming and five went to get more oil for their light had gone out. But the five that were wise, they waited and watched and they continued to watch and they were ready. And the Lord came while the other five were gone and he put them in. Though there were ten looking, only five went in. What does that mean to you? Oh, you who says we all go in a rapture that God never said everybody will be there? Oh, but God has not caused wrath to come upon the church. Indeed, but God has caused judgment to come upon the church. And when he said in the letters to the seven churches that one of them would go into great tribulation, he did say, Blessed are you if you overcome, for there shall be some that will not be taken by the Son into heaven, that will not be the bride of Christ, but they will overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and the fact that they love their lives even unto death. So don't tell me in your pragmatic way and in your spiritual, oh, well, success is we all go and get away from here. Don't tell me how practical that is when the reality of what Jesus said contradicts the words you say. Because while it fits for your certainty of assurances, the reality is that God is the only one who decides what he will do, when he does it, as he does it. And though he has given us his word and promised us, though this is not the Bible, he has said in that day, pray you be counted worthy that you be spared all these things. And I suspect that if you love like he has said to do, if you are in that church that he has said in the letters to the seven churches, then maybe you would be the one. For you see, many are called, but few are chosen. 
And it's not about salvation, but it's about those that are already saved, that few are chosen. For not all of the 12, and not all of the 120, and not all of the 70 were the chosen, now were they? For even one betrayed him. Are you ready to stand with Jesus in that day, raptured or not? Be careful. Be real. And be alive to the possibility that your relationship with God means that you will accept not my will, but thy will be done. What if Jesus says, my will is you should remain? 